In this unit, we're going to be focusing on using the internet and the World Wide Web and focusing on identifying the differences between the two. As you've previously learned, the internet is a worldwide system composed of thousands of smaller networks. But the internet does not solely consist of just the web. It has many different services. There's things like email, instant messaging, we have news groups, there's online conferences, and none of those necessarily need the web. Although the web is the most popular service on the internet, it is not the only service. And in order for the web to exist, the internet must exist. There cannot be a web without the internet. In 1990, Dr. Tim Berners-Lee wrote a small computer program for his own use. This program was called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. We are often commonly call it HTTP. This became the language computers use to transmit hypertext documents over the internet. In order to transmit these documents, they needed to have their own addresses on the internet. So he then developed a text-based program called Hypertext Markup Language. We call it HTML. We often encounter HTML documents when we visit websites. These pages contain hyperlinks to other documents. Whenever we visit a web page and we click on something, it sends an HTTP command to locate that requested page that we're searching for. It sends the command to the hosted web server where all of the website's files are located. The point of a web server is that it delivers or serves up web pages. This web server then sends those pages back to us, the user, so we can see them. In 1993, the number of people using the web increased significantly. This was because Mark Andreessen developed the first graphical web browser. This was called Mosaic. In 1994, he co-founded Netscape Communications, with the new graphical web browsers available to everyone, the web became extremely popular, and the phrase Web 2.0 was coined. It's also called participatory web. This means that users can not only view data on the, on the web, but they can also modify it. Um, think of things like blogs, discussion boards, social networking. You're not just reading information, you're inputting data as well. Sometimes when you're on a website and you're trying to download a program, it prompts you for ActiveX. You need to enable ActiveX. These are a set of rules that controls that program that you're trying to run in your web browser. There are also small text files called cookies. Websites like to use these and put them on your computer to store information about you. For instance, let's say you're going to Facebook and you put in your email address and your password. Sometimes you're prompted asking, do you want to be remembered on this computer? And when you check yes, it saves a text file called a cookie on your computer. That way, every time when you go to Facebook, you're already logged in. A digital ID, otherwise known as a digital certificate, is an electronic signed statement verifying the identity of a person or a company. A certificate is designed to prevent fraud or other illegal activities. Another good way of protecting your data is encrypting it. When data is sent over the internet, it's sent in packets. And along its travels, there are chances where these packets can be intercepted. So encryption is the process of converting those text files into a completely unrecognized format when it's sent but the data is converted to plain text when it reaches its destination. This is very useful when working with credit card purchases. Every website that we visit has its own unique address or an IP address, Internet Protocol address. A domain identifies a website on the Internet, but it's the domain name system that actually converts the domain names into those IP addresses. 
File Transfer Protocol, or FTP, is a way two computers can transfer files between each other. This can be done without even using the World Wide Web. But in order to even be able to FTP, we need to have a connection to the Internet. We need to use an Internet Service Provider, or an ISP, to be able to get that connection. Some common ones that we use today are Comcast, Verizon, Sprint. These companies provide the internet connectivity for us. Now we're all familiar with media files and music files, but there's also podcasts. People publish podcasts usually to give information to others. Many times professors will create podcasts for students, so they can download these podcasts and listen to them at their leisure. SSL is a protocol for managing the security of your messages over the internet. If you were to look in your email settings over your, your phone, you'll notice that there's an SSL setting in there. Now we already talked about how an IP address is the address of a website. Well, a URL is the address of a web page. Uniform Resource Locator. So here is an example of a URL. The HTTP indicates the hypertext transfer protocol. The www indicates that it's on the World Wide Web. The crawl.com is the domain name. That is like the the nice version of the IP address. So we don't have to remember all of the numbers. We just have to remember crawl.com. Hobbies is the folder where my files can be found. Basketball is the name of the page, and HTML is the language protocol used to write the page. So the web browser is the software program you use to view and retrieve the documents on the web. Even though we may have an internet connection, how would we see all of those web pages if we didn't have Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or Safari or Firefox? These are all web browsers. A web cache is a temporary storage area. So once you go to a website, that data is stored in the cache. Therefore, the website can quickly access the stored copy rather than downloading the data all over again the next time you go to it. One specific type of website that is popular in education these days is called a wiki. These are collaborative websites where people can collaborate, they can add, edit, and remove web page content. One of the most popular among students is called Wikipedia. Web pages can have many different elements. A lot of times we just read text, we or sometimes we watch videos, and oftentimes there's many hyperlinks that take us to different areas on that particular site, or maybe even a different site. There can also be interactive objects. For instance, when we need to enter information into a form. There's radio buttons, there's check boxes, there's text boxes. Also, websites have lots of images. Here we see that there are many different web page categories. We use definitely web apps such as Outlook and Google Drive and Dropbox. We also use social networking. And most commonly, we use search engines. These search sites are like Google, Yahoo, MSN. These sites can all be broken down in a variety of ways. So when you're connecting to the internet, this is what's happening. You have an internet service provider at home. The person who's hosting the website that you are trying to access, they also have an internet service provider. So you're home, you're on your computer, you open up your web browser and you type www.facebook.com. When you click enter, it sends an HTTP request across the internet over to the hosted web server. This server finds the document that you're searching for and sends it right back. When using a web browser, here are a couple basics you might need to know. Take a couple minutes to reflect how different your life would be had Dr. Berners-Lee not invented the hypertext transfer protocol and Mark Andreessen had not invented the web browser.